and the people that were with him. And Saul and his 3,000 men happened to find the very cave that David is hiding in. And so that's what's happening in Psalms 57. Um, Saul comes with his men and he chooses to walk right into the cave where David's at and um, use the bathroom. And the Bible says it very specifically. He goes in the cave to relieve himself. And I love how specific the Bible can be about that. Not just that Saul found the cave. Saul walked into the cave to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, so uh, I have four boys and my boys go to the bathroom outside far more often than I ever imagined raising children that they would use the bathroom outside. <laughs> it just tends to be um, one of those things when you're on the road or a long car ride or something and just a little easier for, for little boys to do that than it was for me at that age <laughs> or for girls and women in general. So here we see Saul in this cave using the bathroom, and many of you are familiar with this story. David has an opportunity to come up behind him while he's vulnerable, while he's exposed, while he's not, you know, ready for war at that particular moment and take his life. And David's men are urging him to do that. This is your chance. And they're saying it to David, like God has given you this opportunity right here. I mean, what are the chances he would find our cave and look at how exposed he is you can take his life. And as many of you know, David chooses not to. Um, he does not take the life of Saul, but this is that cave. This is that, you know, surrounding experience that we see David in when he is writing this. He is on the run for his life. And to think about for just a moment as well, part of this backstory, you know, David was anointed king by Samuel, the prophet of God in his teenage years. Um, he was, uh, he was a teenager. He was God's choice for king. And, and so he went from that, from being anointed king, this amazing moment to killing Goliath and being thrust into this, this public fame to then working in the palace for Saul, playing his harp, to try to ease Saul's raging emotions that he was experiencing, to now being on the run for his life because Saul was extremely jealous of David and was trying to kill him at every turn. And so we see this, this, uh, this play out of events that um, I'm sure David never expected from that moment when he was being anointed by the prophet of God, sought out, called out, right? I mean, David was just minding his own business, being a shepherd, tending to his sheep. He wasn't even considered in the lineup of his brothers. God sought him out. The prophet went through all the boys, all the brothers. It was none of them. Do you have another son? Well, he's tending to the sheep. I need him. So he was minding his own business. God chose him. There was no denying it, that God chose him, that God sought him, that God redirected the course of his life and gave him a new purpose. And so you would, you would think that at some point during this running for your life, having spears thrown at you, 3,000 soldiers on the lookout to find you and kill you, you might have a few questions for the Lord. <laughs> what is going on here? You know, what may start as dreams is being to something he never thought would happen when he probably thought his whole life. He would just shout and sheep, and yet he is being called out as Israel's next king. He might start having some dreams with that. He might start thinking about a future, and then all of a sudden, what? <laughs> He's living a nightmare. He's living in an actual nightmare of a situation. And, you know, as, as you study um, in, in First and Second Samuel and um, in the Psalms and how they correlate, David was anointed as a teenager, but he spent the majority of his 20s. So not just a couple months here. We're not talking about, you know, just a short season. The majority of his 20s were spent on the run in and out of caves, hiding, having to get away, having to be on the, you know, watches back at all times for his life because his life was in danger. And I wonder, it would only be human nature for him to think, God, did I miss the mark somewhere? Did I somehow veer off course? You called me as king. You anointed me as king. Shouldn't it have looked a little bit different by now? I mean, especially as the years continue to go on, shouldn't it have been a little bit different? Why would you call and anoint me as king all these years ago for me to be living in a cave, not sure where I'm going to get my next meal? I mean, it would only be human nature. I know I would wonder that. I know I have wondered things like that 
in life when there have been extended seasons of times that are hard, that you feel the distress of life, that you begin to settle into discouragement. And it's easy to start wondering, God, did I miss the mark? Did I not hear you correctly? Did I not make the right decisions? Has something that I've done led me to this place? And yet in David's story, it was not a mistake that he had made that led him to this. God used these years on the run and in the caves to prepare him, to give him the preparation he needed to step into that role as king. But I'm pretty positive he did not see it as preparation. I'm pretty sure he didn't wake up every morning thinking he was showing up for another morning of training and, and you know king orientation here. I'm pretty sure he saw it as what in the world is going on as we read in so many of the Psalms. And this one is very like it. So we're going to read um, in Psalms 27 um, because the great thing about it is that although we're about to hear what he talks about in his distress, what I love about David and what we see so often is he doesn't just stay there. He doesn't just stay in the pit of despair. Um, he very often encourages his, his own heart, his own mind, his own self out of it. Um, so Psalms 57, that's coming up on the screen. It's okay. I was going to say it's frozen on mine. Is it not coming up? It's not. <clears throat> Hang on. Give me just a second. Okay. <clears throat> Why am I spotlighted? Okay. I'm sorry. I, that's okay. It was all ready and now it's like, what happened to it? No problem. <clears throat> Just breathe, Joanna. Yeah. No, there's no time for that. And do you see it? Yes. Yep, there it is. You're amazing, Joanna. Thank you. So Psalms 57, you can um, follow along if you would like. It says, have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you, I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed low in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul. Awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And so we read this and here he is in distress and you hear him say that he was bowed down in distress. And that's what distress does to us so often, doesn't it? We feel kind of hunched over or we feel like it can bring us to our knees when we go through really hard situations or sometimes maybe the situation itself isn't so um, excruciating, but the length of time that you walk through it feels excruciating. There are those, those seasons and those times when we walk through hardship that we feel bowed down in distress, hunched over on our knees, and, and we feel stuck there to a point. And yet we see, as he's written here, that he doesn't just stay stuck in that place. And so if we back up to the beginning of that passage, he starts off this psalm with both a prayer and a complaint. And again, we are reminded from David and through his writing that we have a place to go with our emotions. He is praying to the Lord, but he is opening up his heart. He's wrestling with these emotions before God. And as he is, <clears throat> you also sense his closeness to God and his trust in the Lord as he's praying, as he's being very honest with God, as he's, um, you know, saying, have mercy on me. And the fact that he says it twice, you know, when things are repeated in the Bible, it's for emphasis. They didn't have the bold text or, you know, the ability to put a highlighter in there, but have mercy on me. Oh God, have mercy. <clears throat> 
Then he goes into this, and I love this phrase. It's still in this first stanza here. I will take refuge under your wings. And I want for a minute for us to really focus on this and to get a visual. I will take refuge under your wings. You know, a few different places in the Bible, and this is one of them where it's referring to um, the little chicks that go under their, the, mo the mama hen's wings for protection when there's birds of prey that are out looking for their next meal or when there's danger present and the little chicks run under the mama hen's wings for refuge and they take refuge there. In the New Testament, you see Jesus say this to Jerusalem, to the, that nation, God's holy people, that I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't let me. And so it's this visual of these, these little chicks running to the protection of their mom, of their parent, of their source. So, you know, in, in Psalms 91, it also, it also relates to that, that we find refuge and protection in his wings. And it's referring to God there and under the shadow of his wings is where we are safe. And so defining this word refuge, refuge is a place of shelter, a place of protection or safety. And we don't often use the word refuge in our daily, you know, in our daily vocabulary. It's not something that we often say. We're not very often in our lives in need of a physical place of refuge that we're, that we're running to all the time. But as I was, you know, putting this together, I was reminded of all the rain that we have had this year. We've had a lot of rain. And in fact, Arian and I had to um, buy umbrellas because we could not even find, I'm sure at some point we have owned umbrellas, um, but I don't feel like we ever use them. And so probably in a move or something, they got lost. And so this year, after probably about the third or fourth rainstorm that I found myself caught in with no umbrella, with trying to find something to put over my head and, and run to, I remember um, being at the Scottsdale campus and needing to go to the Target right there in Ashler Hills. And it was barely sprinkling. And of course, when I pull into the parking lot, it was a complete downpour. And there I am with no umbrella. And so we did finally get umbrellas <laughs> again this year. Um, but I ran, I remember just kind of sprinting my way. And I do love the rain, but I don't love to be caught in a downpour when I'm not ready for it. Um, sprinting into that target. And, you know, in that moment, that target was a place of refuge for me. Um, the rain, you know, I was protected from the rain. I was not being pelted uh, by the storm that was present in that moment. And as I ran in, it was like, okay, now I can just relax for a minute, take a breath. I didn't run in and start checking the ceiling to see if there were any holes in it. I didn't run in and think to myself the whole time, I wonder if I'm going to be safe in here, or I wonder if I'm going to get wet. That was a place of refuge. And when we think of what we consider, what we run to, what we go to as a place of refuge, it's a place that we have ch um, made a choice to put trust in. So something as simple as in the middle of an actual storm, I ran into Target and didn't have another thought about if I was going to stay dry. I just knew I was. I was subconsciously placing trust in the structure of that building. I wasn't sitting there the whole time worrying. I had placed trust. When we pick a refuge. We are making a choice. I'm going to place trust. So when we say that God is our refuge, God, you are my place of shelter. You are my place of protection and safety. We are making a choice. God, I'm going to place my trust in you. And I'm going to, and I'm going to allow myself to take that sigh of relief. I'm going to allow myself to, to relax and not to feel like, yes, God, you're my refuge, but are, are you going to make sure that I'm okay? And are you going to make sure? And are you getting all of these things that we sometimes do? We're saying, God, I'm going to you as my refuge. And it's a relief. And we should sense in our spirits the ability to relax, knowing that we can trust God. We're saying, I'm leaning into you, God. And then going right into what he says, David takes it a step further. David says, I will take refuge under your wings. And then he takes it a step further until the disaster has passed. I will take refuge under your wings until the disaster has passed. Meaning until the situation changes, if you're looking for me, you're going to find me under his wings. 
That's my place of refuge until this situation has passed. So not just God, you're my refuge. I am trusting you. I am choosing that you are my place of safety. I'm declaring that. I'm also choosing to keep myself there. The word until. Can we all for just one second, Joanna, can you put it to where we can all see each other again? For one second, can we all come off unmute and say the word until together? Here we go. We're all going to unmute and on the count of three, one, two, three, until, until, until. 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 Okay. We can mute again, but I want us to say the word until I want us, our own mouths to say it out loud because the word until it denotes a passage of time. It, de it denotes some time passing. This is not just, I'm running in, I'm running under those wings, and it's all going to fix, get fixed right then and there. The word until denotes a passage of time. So David says, I will take refuge under your wings until the disaster has passed. You know, we use the word until a lot in our everyday language. We have Bible study from 930 until 11. It denotes the time frame in between when we start and when it finishes. What I have found myself saying at least 10 times a day, you cannot have another snack until you have completed another lesson of schoolwork that you're doing from home. I mean, that's what my regular vocabulary consists of now. But until gives us a passage of time. We're going we're gonna to do this until, unless it doesn't. Sometimes there's not a specified time. Sometimes there is a concrete start and finish. Sometimes all you have is the start time. And right here, what we are seeing David say is, I am making a choice to make God my refuge until, until what? Until the disaster has passed. And he doesn't say when, because quite often, especially in our own personal lives and our spiritual lives, we don't get that ending time frame. And isn't that what causes our frustration sometimes? Isn't that in itself what sometimes causes distress in our lives? God, if I knew I had to walk through this trial for a week or a month or maybe three months, or maybe even if you told me I would walk through this for a year and I knew it, I could handle it differently. But I haven't met a whole lot of people who have been given time frames. I know I never have been for trials that I personally have walked through. And so this word until takes on a whole nother meaning. It's not just something that we commonly throw around and we, you know, we don't really think about. I feel like the word until in this passage causes us to have to pause and really ask ourselves, are we willing to trust God like that? Are we willing to trust God until, until the situation changes? I'm going to be right here under your wings. I'm going to lean in as close as I can. I feel like, um, you know, quite often in that until, in the, in the gap of that, that time frame, we get a little restless. We get a little impatient. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of different things going on and there is this heaviness in the waiting. There is an impatience that wants to rise up in us. There is definitely a restlessness that takes place in our spirit while we're waiting. And I think all of us might feel that a little bit right now with what we're going through in our world today. And this is not the only disaster that we have ever faced or will ever face, but this is a disaster that we are all facing together. This is something that's very different. We have never walked through it before. We have never gone through something like this. And there is a restlessness that, that I know I feel, that I know many of you probably feel starting to creep in when, when is this going to change? When is this going to be over? When is there going to be something different? When are things going to reopen? When are things going to be lifted? When are we not going to feel nervous or, you know, or afraid or anxious for some people? There's a lot of those questions of time frame right now that we still yet don't have answers to. And so, you know, we're in this, we're in this place where we can make a choice and can we declare yes in this situation, but can we place this in our hearts so that every situation of distress that we find ourselves in moving forward, can we declare like David, God, you are my refuge. I am leaning into you until the situation changes. 
or are we like this guy? I'm going to show you a picture. Are we, do we tend to be like this guy over here, which I saw this and had to use it because I quite often am like this guy where we, where we feel like maybe we're peeking out of those wings a little bit. We're, we're getting to where we can peek out of those wings wondering, well, what's going on? I'm under your wings, but, but how long am I really going to be here? You can go ahead and pull that up or maybe you're trying. Is it just not up on my screen? I'm sorry. It was, on okay. my, it was on my screen. I think it'll be on your screen now. Yes, there we go. This, does this resonate with anyone? <laughs> me trying to monitor the things I left in God's hands. Hey, it's me again. Just checking up on the status. <laughs> Is that anybody else? I'm sure it's not just me. <laughs> But that is me quite often. <laughs> Placing thing, yep, I see some hands going up. Okay, thank you, Joanna. I see some hands going up, you know, of times where we give things to God. We say, Lord, I'm placing this in your hands. Lord, I'm choosing to trust you with this. And then we have that gap of time. And when we don't see things changing or we don't see it moving on the time frame that we would like, we get restless and we grow impatient. And there we are, like the little chicks peeking out of the wings, getting to like, all right, maybe I need to go do something about it. Do I need to take this back into my own hands? God, what are you doing? God, what time frame are you on? And instead of asking those questions. Because here, as we read Psalms 57, I don't necessarily see David asking those questions. I see him pouring out his heart to God, but I don't see him asking how long in this particular one. I'm sure I've read a Psalms that say how long. And in this particular one, I don't see him saying that. I see him reminding himself in the distress that he is choosing God as his refuge, that he's allowing himself to lean in and to trust God and to stay under the cover of those wings until the situation turns around and until something different comes and happens. And that is a place of surrender. And it is not easy, but the alternative to that is the anxiety that we feel and the distress that comes from what we can't control. And so we sit, you know, running around trying to do something about it anyway, freaking out feeling afraid, dwelling on the fear, dwelling on the fact that we can't control, and that causes even more distress. So our choices are not lean into God and trust him even though it's hard or go find all the answers. It's lean into God and trust him even though it's hard or try to handle and carry the hard on your own. And I'm sure we've all tried to do that before too, and it usually doesn't end well because we weren't meant, we weren't made with that kind of strength. We weren't made to carry that hard and heavy burden on our own. God has always wanted to carry that with us. And so we move down, um, you know, we, as, we, as we go down, he, he opens up verse two right away with saying, I cry out to God most high. So we see him crying out. We see him opening his heart to the Lord. He sends from heaven and saves me. Has he been saved yet? No. Has he gotten a deliverance plan yet? No, he's still in the cave. He's in the cave writing this, and yet he is encouraging himself in the truth that he knows to be characteristic of God. He is, my God is a savior, so he will save me. And he's encouraging himself in that. He goes through four and, and talks about the different heartaches that he's feeling, and he writes them in the way that, that he is experiencing them and seeing them. And again, right there in verse five, but be exalted, O God. There he is again, turning to praise. This is what I'm experiencing. This is what I'm walking through. And yet here's what I'm gonna say about my God in the midst of all of these things. Then again, back to six, they spread out a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a path, but they have fallen into it themselves. The soldiers didn't kill David that day. He was still in the cave. He was still on the run. It wasn't like Saul, you know, turned over to him and said, you saved my life now. You know, I'm going to honor you. Go ahead and step up and be king. They parted ways and David was still on the run. He wasn't in the clear yet. And then verse seven, my heart, oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. Again, he says it twice for emphasis. God, my situation hasn't changed as drastically as I thought it would. 
I had a moment where I could have made a wrong choice. I chose to walk in obedience. That's a boost in our spirit. Um, you know, that's, that is something that continues to strengthen and build our spirit. And here he says, I'm choosing, even though my situation is not necessarily changed, I'm choosing to be steadfast. The New Living Translation, which I very often like to read out of, it says, my heart is confident in God. That word steadfast, that's what it's meaning. That steadfastness, my heart is confident in God. And I wanted to just share this as I was, as I was reading this chapter, I was reminded of this several years ago. I felt like God taught me a very important lesson about confidence. You know, I think as women at some point or another, we find ourselves, you know, desiring confidence in a moment where we maybe don't feel it, where instead maybe we feel insecure or we're being plagued with insecurities and we're looking for confidence. And there's so many messages that come at us for you know, how to be confident or how to feel confident, how to look confident. And, and you can read articles and you can read books and you can go to all of those things. And I felt several years ago um, we, you know, in ministry, God got a hold of my heart in this area. Um, I, I felt very insecure in a lot of different things and um, always kind of brought those insecurities before the Lord. And I felt at one, one particular time, he spoke this truth to my spirit. And it's a truth that has resonated with me. It's a truth that resonates through the entire Bible as you look. And it's this fact right here that true confidence has nothing to do with you. So to me that day, how I heard it in my spirit was true confidence has nothing to do with me. True confidence has nothing to do with you or the way you feel about yourself or your situations or your circumstances. And that, that truth in my spirit kind of hit me out of nowhere. And I just pondered it for a while. And as I was looking through the word to back this up, oh, was this just a random thought or was this a God thought? You know, I found it to be true. That God has not called us to just be confident and figure out how to be confident, figure out how to muster it up in your own self. God has called us to be confident and bold, but in him. And when I realized that that really is the truth, that, that confidence, my confidence, the way that I can continually be confident, it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with the fact if I think my hair looks good or my makeup looks good, or I like my outfit or things are going good in life or I feel affirmed by other people. Those are all great things, but those are all fleeting things. Those are all things that can come and go at any moment. But when my confidence is in the Lord, that is when my confidence can be steadfast. That is when my heart can remain steadfast. It can remain confident because left to my own, my confidence is like this. <laughs> Left to my own, one day I might feel confident and then something else happens or another situation comes and there went, my, there went the rug pulled out from underneath and now I'm sensing insecurities. But when our confidence is in the Lord, then it doesn't matter how I feel about the things going on around me or how I feel about myself with the spirit of God living in me. If he is the one that I have chosen to be confident in, then I myself can remain confident. I can walk in confidence. I can say like David, my heart is steadfast. I am steadfast and I am confident in God and in what he will do through me and what I know to be true of him, of the work that he's doing in and through me. I don't need to be confident in my own self. And it's not mustering that up. If we want an unshakable confidence so that we can be steadfast women and not women who are all over the place, women who can feel their emotions, recognize them, experience them, and yet remain solid and steadfast and confident in the midst of discouragement and in the midst of everything we face, then our confidence has to be in God in the midst of everything that we do. And again, that is a choice that we choose to make God our refuge. And we choose to lean into that. And we choose to allow him to be our confidence. And so every time, and I'll be honest with you, I still battle insecurity all the time. And every time I feel that wrestle with insecurity starting to rise up in me, I go back to that statement that I felt the Lord placed in my spirit over 10 years ago. I go back to that. No, that, that, right, that struggle is a lie from the enemy. My confidence comes from God. And that is how I can remain confident to what he has called me to do, whether it's waiting whether it's moving forward, whether it's talking to someone, whether it's going beyond my comfort zone, whatever it is, I can remain confident 
because my confidence is in an unshakable source. So David is in this cave. He is in this cave sitting in distress by the very definition, feeling all the things, feeling all of those feelings, having those experiences, and yet he's writing a prayer. He's penning a worship song. I love that so many of the Psalms, I mean, for years now, I have always found this so interesting, and this one is no different. So many of the Psalms go ahead and tell you the tune that they're meant to be sung by. I mean, has anybody else ever kind of laughed at that? I have laughed, like wondering to myself, who, who knows this tune? <laughs> who living on the earth today knows the tomb to the tomb of do not destroy? That is what this psalm is to the tomb of do not destroy. I just find that to be, um, I'm sure maybe somebody does. And if you personally are on here and you know it, I would love to hear it. Is that anybody? You could sing it for us. You could tell us um, what tune it is meant to be. I don't see any hands up. But he is writing a song um, in the cave. He is in the cave on the run for his life. And he is writing a worship song to the Lord. And in fact, heaven had placed into a popular worship song that has been sung in churches and played on the radio where it talks about great is your love reaching to the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Um, I think third day, maybe I'm wrong, but that was a worship song that was placed. And so he is sitting in the cave and he is writing out a prayer and he is putting together a worship song. He's singing in the cave. He's singing in the cave. He's sitting in distress. He is bowed low in distress and he is singing worship to the Lord in the cave. He's crying out. He's pouring out his heart. And in doing so, he's reminding himself of the truth that he doesn't have to be stuck there, that he doesn't have to be stuck in that posture of distress, in that bowed low, hunched over, bring me to my knees. This is hard. It doesn't feel fair. I don't want it. When is it going to end? I can't wait till it's over. And yet, until, until the situation changes, Lord, you are going to be my refuge. And I am going to remind my heart, my spirit, my soul of the truth of who you are and how great you are and that you are a faithful God in the waiting. My soul is singing. In the waiting, here I am worshiping. In the distress, in the hard, in the heavy, in the disaster, my heart is going to sing to the Lord. The other significant thing that I, I thought is worth noting is that he is sitting in a cave, but he's not looking at the cave as his place of refuge. He was hiding in the cave. The cave was keeping him protected. It was his hiding place, but he didn't look at the cave as his place of refuge. He looked beyond that to God. And he still chose to place his trust in the Lord beyond his immediate situation and beyond the immediate um, reprieve of what he was facing, that God continued to be his source um, that was leading him to different places of protection. And yet he continued to look to the greatness of God. So I think for us, as we read this, as we hear it, as we look at what he was walking through, and yet in the midst of what he was walking through, what he was saying, what was coming out of his mouth causes us to ask ourselves, what do we do in distress? What do we do when we're facing the hard and the heavy and we don't know when it's going to let up? Again, this was years and years and years of David's life. He was given an incredible promise from God. And then sent into this spiral that he never would have expected. You know, do we withdraw and isolate? Those are very common feelings. When we're walking through a hard time, we pull away. We pull away from people. And sometimes it's because we feel like we don't want to burden somebody else. Oh, I know they're walking through their own stuff. I don't need to share what I'm going through. You know, that's why we do Bible studies like this. That's why we have small groups. That's why we offer to pray because there is healing. There is freedom in being able to share, not withdrawing and isolating. And if I'm honest and if I'm being vulnerable, that's something that I wrestle with and struggle with. I can very easily to my own self think about when I'm going through a hard time. Well, I know all these other people that are going through a much harder time. So instead of talking about what I'm going through, I should just be trying to help them in what they're going through. But again, that's where the enemy wants to keep us trapped, isolated, feeling uncared about. And, and the Lord is not doing that. He's drawing us to be able to pour out our heart. Like we see 
David do over and over in the scripture, we are encouraged to pour out our heart to God. Um, you know, maybe you feel like you can't go to God in distress if you haven't been doing all the things that you should have been doing up to that point. Sometimes we feel the guilt of, well, I haven't really been faithful in my relationship with God. So can I really go to him now that I'm walking through a hard time? Is he really even going to hear my prayer during this time again? Yes, he wants us. He invites us over and over to come to him. And David continually is our example of that. So as we have read Psalms 57 and we have pulled out some of the important things to note, you know, I just want to give four ways that we can really apply this, four ways that we can really make this our truth. You know, that while we're in the cave, while we are facing hard situations, we can stay encouraged. And it's exactly what we saw him doing. We can cry out to God with our feelings. We can pour out our hearts before the Lord in prayer. That is first and foremost where we should always be pouring out our hearts. You know, before we find all the people to pour them out to, it should be a place between us and the Lord where we pour out our hearts so that initially he can help us process those things. And this is honestly what helps us stay emotionally and spiritually healthy is when we do this. When we bring the Lord our hurts and our hard and our questions and our frustrations, this is what helps us go deeper in our relationship with God and be more authentic and be more sound in our spiritual lives. Number two, we can choose to sing in our caves, just like we see David doing here. We can worship through the hard times. And thankfully, you don't have to have a good voice to do that. You can still choose to worship through the hard and heavy moments in the midst of distress. We can choose to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness and his promises found in his word. Because that's what David does. Every other stanza, you see him go back and forth. This is my situation, but God, this is who I know you are. This is where it's hard and I don't know what's going to happen here, but God, you are faithful. And so we go back and forth. We're pouring out our heart, but we're reminding ourselves of the truth that we know in God's word. And lastly, we can follow the example that David teaches us by choosing to be confident, secure, and steadfast in God. That that is where our hope is found. And if we can do, you know, if we can do these things, if we can say this to ourselves, let this be our prayer. Lord God, you are my refuge until my situation changes. If you're looking for me, that's where you're going to find me, leaning into God, leaning into his strength, leaning into his wisdom, relying on him, waiting on him to show me the next right step that I am supposed to take. And until he shows me that next right step, until my situation changes, I will continue to wait on the Lord and lean on him, not impatiently run into check. Is it done yet? Is it done yet? Peeking out of those wings, peeking out of those feathers. Just get that, you know, that graphic in your mind. Let's not be that guy, even though we're often that guy. Let's be, let's, to be what David shows us, that example. And before we split up into our groups, and I'm going to walk with this real quick, I wanted to read yesterday in my Jesus Calling devotional, um, I got a new one. I've used the same one for a long time, and I got a new one at Easter, um, and it came later. But it was exactly, I had been spending time putting together this teaching. And if you're not familiar with Jesus calling, she writes it as though Jesus is speaking to you. And I felt like it went the first couple lines. I'm just going to read the first two sentences. It went so hand in hand with this as a reminder. And so this is God, just a reminder taken from the scripture of God speaking this to our hearts. I am worthy of all your confidence, all your trust. So refuse to let world events spook you. Instead, pour your energy into trusting me and looking for evidence of my presence in the world. Whisper my name to reconnect your heart and mind to me quickly. I am near to all who call upon me. Let me wrap you up in my abiding presence and comfort you with my peace. And I just felt like what an amazing reminder for all that we are walking through right now, that we don't let anything go in around us, spook us but we choose to lean in. We choose to look to God as our refuge and allow him to wrap us up in his peace. 
And that can happen even if we are in a cave, even if we are in a place of distress, in a situation that is hard. And all of us right now, our homes may all feel like caves right now because we have been in them for so long. <laughs> and it might feel like your home is your cave. So be encouraged that even if it does, you can worship there. You can experience the presence of God there. Your heart can be encouraged there. God can speak wisdom and purpose to your life there. He can meet us in our caves. And I love this Psalm. So I would encourage you this week to take any portion of this Psalm. For me, it's those verses that God, you are my refuge and I will stay here until the situation changes, but take something from this and turn it into a personal prayer that you can be praying and speaking and declaring over your life. Because again, the word of God is powerful. Prayer is powerful. But when we pray the word of God over our lives, it's powerful because we are aligning our prayer with the word of God and it's prayers that he loves to answer. So we're going to split off into our small groups from here. Hello, Christy Flanagan. I see you have joined. Um, so we're going to go uh, with our small group leaders. Again, if you're new, you're going to get an invitation. Click up on your screen to join a small group. We will come all back together at the end at 1050. We'll come all back together and we'll, um, we'll close out our time together. Thank you, Joanna, for organizing all of our groups. Okay, we have time now, but I feel like Monday starts and then before you know it, the weekend is there. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like we are having this day over and over again. Yeah. So we have someone new in our group. Um, Christy, <clears throat> do you want to unmute yourself? Hi. Hey, <clears throat> we don't have video on you. Um, <laughs> Well, I have, I'm here, here. Perfect. but I got my little woods too, so that's okay. um, that's, it's kind of hard for me to hold my phone. That's why I don't have my video on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a new normal. Yeah. Well, I always have this one. I just don't always have my other one at home. So cute. How old is your little one? <coughs> He's almost two. Cute little bug. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yesterday when I was at the Dream Center, um, none of the babysitting volunteers are able to go right now. And so in the Sons Learning Center, I had, gosh, probably almost 18, 19 girls, and then um, probably seven, eight babies. And I was like, oh. okay, <laughs> I have an unassigned participant. Hang on just a second, guys. Let me, oh, Elaine, let me put Elaine in Deb's group. Deb, perfect. If they don't accept the invitation right away, it pops up on my screen. So, all right. So, how are you guys doing? Doing well. How about you, Joanna? Good. Just same old, same old. <laughs> I, I, I'm super dressed up today because I actually have a um, a virtual party at noon. So, oh, fun. I had to, I'm kind of yeah. <laughs> okay. Got to, girls. Got to work. Um, so let's jump into this because last week we ran out of time. Um, all right. So do you all have the questions in front of you? Oh, yeah. Yes. Everybody has them. Karina, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, girl. Okay. So I'll make Karina answer the first one. 
It says, in times of distress, do you generally seek out other people or do you withdraw? That's not too hard. Yeah, um, I say it depends. For the most part, I think I withdraw. I hate, like, I don't know. I think I'm, I think I like to go and like comfort myself and just like deal with it myself. But sometimes if it's like a situation where it's like too much for me, like I will go and like get help. But for the most part, I withdraw. Okay. Anybody else? I do now. <laughs> you withdraw right now? I used when I, many years ago when I was a lot younger, which Sometimes I still think I am, but uh, yeah, I used to go to other people, but you know, we moved a lot. It was about eight moves in a 10 year period. Mm -hmm. And so I tended to just corral myself in. In fact, I remember being in a new group and I had just spent four months living with my mother with um, three children. It was not a good summer. <laughs> and my mom's really, really strong and she's always right. So um, God bless her. <laughs> and I was in this new group and this one young woman was praying that her new one would grow. And I thought, okay, hold everything of mine in. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm not having a, a new lawn. I am just in, a, in several billion people here. <laughs> That's classic. Yeah, I, I usually protect myself. That's classic. <laughs> Anybody else? Do y'all withdraw or do you go to people? You go to others? Well, for me, I don't really go to others right away. You know, that doesn't mean, it's not a negative way, but I think sometimes if you just tend to reach out to people, I think you forget to reach out to the Lord. Mm -hmm. To me, it's like crying out to the Lord is the first. And so, you know, I think that's where my focus is usually um, not necessarily pick up the phone and, you know, call somebody, but, um, you know, asking somebody to pray with me, yes, you know, in that situation. Uh, but not necessarily seeking out people. I, at first I thought I would draw, but I actually have a um, really, really close friend who's in my business and she um, lives in San Diego and I bounce a lot of things off of her and she bounces a lot of things off of me, whether it has to do with business or family or whatever. The interesting thing is, is that, um, she is um, going through, um, she's 10 years younger than me. So her kids are 10 years behind my kids. And it's interesting how she'll reach out to me and say, okay, how did you not kill your teenagers? <laughs> and here's the, here's the ironic part. I remember about 10 years ago, her saying, all we ever do is talk about your problems with your kids. I remember her saying that. And I have, I have brought that up a few times to her. Well, I guess our entire conversation today was about how not to kill your children. I'm glad, I'm glad we got some work done today, Dre. Be careful what you say, okay? All right. But yeah, we, we bounce things off of each other a lot. And it kind of it gives you a perspective because, um, you know, if I go to my husband with everything, he thinks my life is filled with chaos and drama. And once I say it, I'm done. You know, are y'all like that? Like, you're like, okay, I'm good. And they're still trying to fix the problem. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Karen, go to God first. That's. that's <laughs> well, I, I have to, you know, when I tell my husband, I have to tell him saying, well, I'm not telling you to, you know, get upset with so-and-so. I'm just saying it because I just want to share it with you, mm -hmm. you know, not to resolve it or not to try to fix it. Men are fixers. <laughs> oh, yes. You have to measure what and how you share. Because <laughs> they're like, well, what do you want me to do with this? Well, nothing. What? Then why did you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> 40 years has its perks, I guess. I've learned a couple things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Okay. So let's go to number two. Um, describe the picture of God's comfort that David paints in verse one. And it says, have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me. What, what does that look like in your mind? Um, I think he's like painting God as like a safe place. Like saying that, like to say that you want to take refuge in someone or like to hide under their wings. Like I'm pretty sure you would view them as like this shield, like as a shield or like safety. Mm -hmm. I think of the, the Syrophoenician woman that she was, we don't even know if she was pagan. But she came to Jesus and said, please heal my daughter. And Jesus' answer always shocks me. He says, well, I came for the children of Israel. But she said, even the children pick up the crumbs, you know, the dogs pick up the crumbs under the table. You know, and so she had faith and confidence in God's mercy for her. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I picked up crumbs under the table a few times. Yeah. As usual, Lisa is just dominating the whole group. <laughs> okay, let's go to David responds to God's care in verse seven saying that his heart is steadfast, which Allison explained to us, he has confidence. What is the significance of this response? So in verse seven, it says, my heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. You know, it's, it's funny. You think in times of trouble, in times of stress, in times of, I don't know what to do. Let's sing. <laughs> but all throughout the Bible, um, armies marched into war singing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, when, when you look at that um, confidence, um, I, I was looking at it a little more in the Proverbs um, chapter 14, 26, it talks about in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will have refuge. Mm. Um, so when you think about it, you know, David, he, you know, has such great reverence for the Lord. He, he has experienced him, you know, so here he is like, you know, he is asking him for mercy. He's so desperate. That's what I see it. He's so desperate. He's like, okay, I can't do this. I, I, you know, he's running away. He's trying to, you know, um, save his life. And so he's like, okay, Lord, I can't do anything. So I am, you know, so he's got such confidence in the Lord in spite of all that he's going through right now. And, you know, when we look at that verse, it's like in the fear of the Lord, you know, so I, I think that's, the, you know, we, we talk about the fear of the Lord and I know it's not mentioned here, but you know, it's a beginning of wisdom. It's beginning of everything, the fear of the Lord. Karen, what was that scripture? Proverbs, what? 14, 26. Okay. I have to take a look at that one. I can screen share it if you guys want. My Bible. <laughs> it may take me 15 minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> then they'll be keep pinging on us, you know, wondering where are we? Oh. <laughs> and before we, I have to say, in my defense, before we have Bible study, I have everything set up, and then for some reason it's like, okay, now I have to pull it up again. But that's okay. Y'all are patient. Um, okay, that was good. Thank you, Karen. That was great. Um, 1 Samuel 24 tells the story behind the psalm. Read 24, 1 through 7, and 16 through 20. How did God take care of David in this time of great distress? So 
um, 1 Samuel 24. Does anybody want to read that? So it's 24. 24, 1 through 7, and 16 through 20. Okay, I'll read through 1 through 7 if you like. I'd love that. Yeah. So after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Mm. Talk about respect mm -hmm. for leadership. Yeah, and submission mm -hmm. to the authority that, recognizing that God had set that authority up. Mm -hmm. Render under Caesar. Yeah. Um, so does anybody want to read 16 through 20? Does anybody have it? Kat, thanks. Do it, yeah. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me of the good you did to me, and the Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my na name from my father's family. I went one verse too long. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but, but what did what do you see there? What what has happened now? I know David, you know, in between, David had come to the mouth of the cave, and I assume it was overlooking where the army was. And Paul saw what he did, you know, look, I have the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. And Saul is very repentant at this point. But I also know that Saul resumed his pursuit of David. He did not. Manic depressive or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just see a complete reversal of roles because first David is hiding in the cave to hide from Saul and then Saul is at the front of the cave and David is the one that's now in control of his destiny and he spares his life. So it's just a complete reversal. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Because I, th I think, you know, at this time, David knows that Saul is anointed by the Lord. Mm -hmm. And no matter what Saul does, and he's thinking, okay, you know what? The Lord will take care of it. Mm -hmm. You know, between you, he'll let him come between you and me and let him judge, be the judge. Because on my hand, you know, he doesn't want to take, do anything with Saul to, you know, for the Lord to come and say, well, you know, to punish David on that. So he is respecting that and knowing that God has anointed him. Yeah. Yeah. 
He's waiting on God's solution. Yep. And not taking it into his own hands. How hard is that? <laughs> and maybe, you know, sometimes we think, oh, that's the opportunity here, right in front of me, right? Maybe God wants me to do this. <laughs> but he didn't think that. You know, he knows that I cannot touch his life. That is, you know, let God, I mean, even though he was, I'm so good to you. I mean, even if we read it later on, it'll say, you know what, I've done this, done this. You know, the whole passage and, you know, Saul's like, okay, yeah, you've done so, you're, you're so good to me. Here, I'll let you go. You know, but of course, we know the story, how Saul feels about David. Um, but David just trusting God, just trusting God that God will take care of him. Well, and he did not listen to the counsel of those around him either. That's right. He, he listened to God. Yep. yep. I think it's almost like God provided him with a conscience. Mm -hmm. Because it says after he cut the robe, it says afterward, David's heart yeah. spoke him. A little nudge there. Yeah. How do y'all think David knew this was not God presenting Saul to him so that he could kill Saul. You think it's what, what Lisa just said, that it was that, that voice in his, in his conscious saying, this is not the time. I think as you read through the Psalms, you realize the spirit of God was on him. The hand of God was on him. And almost like he had learned to listen to God. Right. Besides, you know, pouring out his heart, he also learned to listen to God. And so that, you know, moved by the spirit, I guess, would be how I would phrase it, which he was allowing the spirit to speak through his conscience. Good. <clears throat> All right, so let's go to number five. This is a long one. Hopefully, most of our times of distress will not be as drastic as this story from David's life. However, any time of distress is a time when our awareness of our need of God may be heightened. It's true. Think of a time when you were in distress, maybe right now. Uh, were you able to cry out to God for help at that time? Why or why not? <clears throat> and I think one of the things that Allison touched on and she talks about insecurity and all is maybe your first response might be who am I that you know I I can cry out to God and and he's going to help me I you know I haven't been a loyal and faithful servant at all times I you know our natures are sinful and who are we to be able to go directly to God? You know, sometimes it, it, I come from a Jewish background family. My mother was Jewish and um, it just, when you study before Christ came, what they had to do, mm -hmm. there was no, there was no direct connection to God. You had to go and sacrifice and you had to, go through the priests and the Sadducees. And I mean, you had to, the, you were so disconnected from God mm -hmm. all those years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Jesus uh, in Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 and 16 um, talks about, you know, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, you know, knowing that Jesus, what he went through, like, you know, you said in the Old Testament, you know, that's not how, you know, they had to do the sacrifice and all that. Now we know Jesus is our sacrifice, what he went through. So it says, you know, we can go to the throne of grace with confidence and we find mercy and here you know you see the psalm talking about you know have mercy have mercy mm -hmm. and um you know I'm, i mean i know we are 
uh, short on time. So I don't want to get into too much, but I, I was in one of the situations one time where I had to really, I would be driving. I know we were, you know, with our business and just the enemy was coming our way, just so many things. And I remember would I ever, I felt like I was in a pit. Would I ever come out of that pit? And I remember just crying out. I didn't have kids in the car. So I would just, just, would just cry out to the Lord. And I thought, Lord, when will I come out of the pit? Will you show mercy? You know, and of course he, you know, delivered us through that time. But, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I can definitely relate to, I mean, not, you know, how long David went through, but, you know, knowing that he will come through every time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I get that owning your own business and you're the president and you're the janitor. <laughs> <laughs> and everything, everything in between. Um, a lot of crying out to the Lord. And we've had seasons. Um, you know, the season of all those moves and I was either pregnant or nursing a baby during all those years. And, um, cause Scott would, I mean, there were job changes that came for really off the wall reasons. And, um, they always made a, <clears throat> made a move. I mean, we had to move, but, um, I feel like over, over and over God, well then having really strong words for me. <laughs> that didn't go by the book um, felt like God had brought me to the end of myself many many times and um, I had nowhere else to go my, my parents were not people I could go to our moves I they were I didn't have time to develop deep relationships like in church and so I really I, I felt like I was in a corner and I had no other place to go. Yeah. I get it. How many of y'all have moved a lot besides Kathy and I? Christy, you have? Um, yes. Karina, just a little jaunt to cross the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, Karina, you made I moved move. all the way from India to US. So. Culture shift. Yeah, a complete culture shift. <laughs> but I, you know, I was newly married, so I was very excited. So. <laughs> Deeply in love. <laughs> yeah. I think just on the point of distress, I mean, everybody right now is feeling some sort of distress and it all seems to be related to COVID-19. But when I look at my life, there's always something going on. And I know that all of you can probably relate. And I feel like the Lord tells me if, if there aren't any problems or there aren't any small issues, then people just think that they don't need me. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a conscious reminder and we do have these times of distress, one for learning and developing our character, but if things get too good and too easy, people get super confident on their own and they, you know, they don't think that they need the Lord. And just in David's life, he literally went from one season of hardship to another. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like when COVID is over that the distress is going to be lifted and everything's going to be fine. It'll just be something, something okay. different, something new to deal with. And so as Christ followers, you have to constantly be connected to the Lord, knowing that the next season of distress is coming yep. and that we have Christ to deliver us through that season, regardless of how big or how small it is. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine people who don't have faith what what they feel. Yes. Yes. We have a son-in-law. My only son-in-law is not a Christian. And um, he's very anxious. Yes. He's very anxious. And uh, which is, you know, you pray for him every day. So. Yeah. There. Yeah. I have a lot of people in my life who have a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. I almost feel good because I'm pretty relaxed. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I'm just too dumb to doubt. I'm like, yeah, what it is. 
you know, when I went to the dream center yesterday, the girls are like, Miss Joanna, are you scared? Are you? And I'm like, nope, I'm good. <laughs> Who is that, Christy? This is my little girl, Maeve. Hi, Maeve. Maeve, you're beautiful. beautiful. You are beautiful. <laughs> when we come back to church, I'll have to let you see my Barbie car. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen it. We've seen it in the parking lot, the Mary Kay one. Is that your car? Pink. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's fun. And when little girls see it, they always go, Barbie. And I'm like, not quite. Yeah. I, I, will tell I will tell y'all something funny to end um, on, a, on a fun note today. When um, Jules was really little and... Um, Andy's actually her stepdad, but he adopted her and my son. But she said, Mommy, you and Daddy are like Barbie and Ken. And I, <laughs> I like that. And she goes, but you're, you have dark hair, so you're evil, Barbie. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, thanks. Made my day. Okay, so she is, oh, she's going to start texting me, so we're going to have to wrap up. I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> close our break, breakout rooms, and then we have like a minute. So, um, okay, 60 seconds. So you guys, if y'all have prayer requests or anything, um, you know, put it in the chat, and I will send that out to you guys. Oh my gosh, she is so stinking cute. Oh my word. Where'd you get those eyes? Ah, oh, look Good. at her mom. Beautiful. So cute. Um, who did we lose? We lost Lisa. She oh. might have turned to the main session. Okay. All right. So let's head over there. And you guys, um, I'm going to, you know what, Christy, I need to get your cell number. So if you just want to put it in the chat at the bottom. And then um, y'all just, I'll send a text out to everybody when we finish. And I'm just seeing if I have time. Bye. And then um, if y'all have any requests, we'll put it in the group chat. Hello, Christy. Hi, Dave. Hi, Holden. Hi, guys. Hi, Joanne. Good to see you earlier. Good to see you. Okay, so Jan's group is back. Deb's group is back. Yep. Nice to you. Oh, Joanna, your group is So everybody, Mary. Okay, we're all back. I got to get going, though. <laughs> okay, Sue. So, all right, good to see you, Sue. Glad that you were able to jump on. Yeah, we're just going to pray. We'll pray all together um, and we'll end. I know we're doing specific prayer requests in our group. And please know that if there's anything specifically that you are walking through, please reach out to your group leader. Um, she will be covering you in prayer uh, as well as the rest of your group praying. But let's just end out our time in prayer together on here. So Father God, thank you for another amazing morning, God, with just um, this incredible community. Lord, as your daughters, God, I, I thank you that we get to be sisters in Christ, Lord, that we can link arms, Father, and we can encourage each other and sharpen each other and speak life into each other. Lord, I pray that as we were, were reminded from your word today, God, that we would walk into the rest of this week, God, knowing that whatever comes our way, Father, that you are our place of refuge. And God, we can trust you and we can remain as steadfast women. Lord, let our hearts find confidence in you and let that confidence, Lord, exude into every area of our lives. Father, that we would confidently walk forward, um, just even in this season that we are currently walking in. God, I just continue to pray your provision over every one of these ladies, God. I pray that you would continue to grant us your wisdom, Lord, as we make decisions um, during this time, God. But yes, that Lord, every need would be met, Father. I pray protection, um, Lord, and just health, Father. We thank you that you are a God that we can trust, that we can lean into you, God, trusting in you as our refuge. Uh, I pray that our hearts would continue to be stirred by your word this week, Father, um, and that we would just grow and be the women that you have called and created us to be in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So next week, we are going to look at Psalms 65, a prayer of gratitude. Um, so if you would like to be reading that this week, you can uh, be looking over that. 
and we'll send out the discussion questions. Hi, Robin. We'll send out the discussion questions for that um, as well so you can see those. Um, and thanks for being a part today, ladies. Glad to have all of you on here. Thankful for the new faces that joined and, um, and got to be on here. This is just, I'm so thankful that we have this way uh, to stay connected with each other and to get to see each other and still be in community because we need it. So thank you, thank you. You can all unmute and we can Brady bunch it out of here. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Everybody have a good day. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye, Robin. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear your voice. Yes, Bye. good to hear yours too. Your beautiful southern accent. Love y'all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Elaine, it's so nice to see you on here. I'm glad it worked this Thank week. You. Thank you. It's a it's very odd. It's a whole new thing for me. It's a but whole new I did world. It right. I got the camera going and Hi, I got the <laughs> you did. Did good. Did good. You'll become a pro in no time. <laughs> oh yeah. Bye, Adele. Bye, you guys. Bye, Ella. Ella's watching Frozen. Aw. <laughs> the only way I've been able to get through these Zoom calls. <laughs> Hey, Frozen whatever one, it Frozen takes, two. right? <laughs> whatever it takes in those moments. Uh, okay, good. Well, Joanna, I've got to jump off and get on our Scott Still staff call, but um, I'm just going to try to, I, I didn't for, um, I mean, I'll add the new ladies that I saw jump on and then I'll just try to send that through in our group. I've got it. It's fine, Allison. I'll just pull up what you sent me and I'll make the changes and you can approve it and then send it out. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.